Hey, what's up, everybody? It is Kellen here from Star Your Systems, and welcome to another edition of MX Jose TV Supercross Encore Official Track Gameplay Videos. And today is our last installment. Unfortunately, we've run out of rounds. But that means that the final round is upon us in Las Vegas, round number 17 of the series, the 16th video in this uh, game that we've done with the official tracks because there was no Daytona, as you might recall. And uh, doing 15 laps today, as again, I will be discussing real life Supercross after we go over the track a little bit and you guys get to take a look at what this track looks like. Very cool of uh, Rainbow Studios to actually get down and like build a stadium for this particular round. They tried to somewhat replicate Sam Boyd Stadium, but then obviously had to make it look not like Sam Boyd Stadium due to copyright use and stuff like that. Like you can't use a stadium's likeness um, without their permission. So they did what they could with that. Um, and they came out with a pretty kind of cool looking stadium and then built obviously the Las Vegas track map onto it. And a uh, very, very unique track like Las Vegas always seems to put out. And, and then they also put this cool little freestyle section out in the back um, that you can check out on Freeride. It's not really like that different than some of the other freestyle stuff in this game, but it's still pretty cool. So I'd check it out if you um, have the official tracks. You can go into Freeride and then Freeride any of these tracks. As for the track though, typical Vegas outside of the stadium and then back in. Ski jump into sand rollers is a little new as it's normally just a regular ski jump, but this time they're into sand rollers. And then a uh, left 90, seven jumps, a left 180, a super cross triple, and then a right 90, which I just went through. Small double into a whoop section, a 180 into another whoop section. So back to back whoop sections, that might be a key part of the track this week. And then a left 180 that shoots you back down the start straight, which is actually in the stadium for once, which is kind of weird. You kind of kink off to the left after going backwards down the start straight and then not really a 90 degree, like more than a 90 degree into the finish line. And then uh, a 90 after the finish into the second longest rhythm on the track. Cause I feel like when you 180 into this first turn complex again, this rhythm section is actually a little bit longer. I've been trying to nail some of the bigger lines in it. And I think I just got one of them right there going three, four, four, and can't really get all the way out. It's kind of tough to carry your momentum. It's the thing I'm not very good at in this game in general. I'm trying to get better. I feel like through this series and playing the game and stuff, I've actually gotten pretty good at this game, but I'm still nowhere near the level of some of the other people I've seen play this game. So I guess one day I will uh, just have to keep dreaming about that. But uh, yeah, on the real life Supercross, lots to talk about. East Rutherford was wild and completely flipped the 450 Supercross championship upside down um, from what I kind of thought it was going to do. Um, all year long I've been predicting that Ryan Dungey is going to win this championship and that Eli Tomac doesn't have this kind of level of unexpected consistency in him where he just goes out and wins every week and, and is kind of unfazed by that even at Salt Lake City you know coming from way back to win that main event I was like all right what you know what's gonna stop him at this point he's ridiculous um, and I will say he didn't look that that good in practice didn't look that good in his heat race at New Jersey but I was still kind of like all right well you never know like main event comes around he kind of turns it up or at least if he rides kind of like he is right now at least he's gonna hit the podium no matter what so whatever and uh, obviously this is spoiler alert central for those of you that haven't watched the race, but um, Tomac and Dungey ended up starting together and in third and fourth, I believe it was Millsaps and Anderson that was in front of them. And um, they both worked their way around Millsaps. And then as Tomac was starting to reel in Anderson for the lead, Anderson just dumped it all by himself, which uh, as I understand, he was mega kicking himself over because he had he thought he had a chance of winning that race. Um, but uh, yeah, Tomac went to the lead. Uh, Dungey quickly tr like moved into second and was like kind of just ready to set sail after him. And we're like, oh boy, here we go. Is this going to be Tomac pulling away or is Dungey going to actually have something for him? Uh, well, it turns out the mistake that I kind of had been waiting on Tomac to make for a, a while. Not that I wanted him to crash, but I just didn't feel like... Um, he was going to go that long without making some sort of weird kind of crash or another bike malfunction or something just weird was going to happen. And sure enough, 
a simple tuck of the front wheel in a 180 corner before the uh, first Supercross triple at East Rutherford was all it takes apparently to ruin like what has it been 12 weeks of just ripping apart Dungey's 28 point lead that he had or whatever ridiculous it was because Tomac slides the front end down and then uh, the bike ends up kind of upside down so as he's trying to pick it up it stalls because he can't get his hand under the clutch and he kind of takes a sweet time to start the bike too like I know it would, it's a frustrating situation and it's really hard to pick up a 450 uh, believe me I've tried uh, several times especially when they're upside down it's not very fun so I'm not saying like I would have done any better or what the hell Tomac pick up the bike faster but it did seem like he lacked a little sense of urgency to like get going and and you know get the bike started or whatever finally got it going and he was like 16th like lost every every position on the track that was for position and um, my brain was like, uh-oh, that's, that's tough because this track is really, really tough to pass on. And, and it was, like it took him a long time to get even kind of back into the top 10 in some aspect. And then he made a really big mistake out of the corner before the triple again and uh, cased the double of the triple and stalled again. And like, it just, it was not a good night for Tomac. And mentally it seemed like he was kind of falling apart just a little bit. Uh, a la his 2013 Salt Lake City mental breakdown that he had when Ken Roxon missed the main event and then Tomac just kind of couldn't put anything together. Ended up sixth, even though he started in second, so um, kind of cost him the title when it came to him versus Roxon that year. But uh, we'll see if it cost him the title this year. Now the thing that every single person is talking about from this race is not Tomac um, you know, crashing all by himself, making a lot of mistakes, having a tough time working through the field, uh, losing a ch huge chunk of championship points in the process, the likes of which that he probably won't recover from, even if he wins and Dungey has a kind of tough race in Vegas. Um, this is, this is kind of going to be a tough one for Tomac to win given Dungey's track record at this point. Nope. Everybody's talking about Team Tactics, because Marvin Muscan, yes he did, let Ryan Dungey win that main event. He did. Obviously that's what he did. Um, I'm kind of surprised that it took until now for KTM to kind of install some sort of team tactic in play, whether it be with Marvin or with any of the other 150 KTM factory affiliate teams, um, namely the Butler Brothers KTM team that Millsaps and Baggett rides for. I kind of can't believe that uh, they weren't being a little friendlier with them before. Now Millsaps did kind of let Dungey go in Seattle for fourth, but uh, nobody really paid attention to that. Um, he didn't really put up much of a fight when Dungey got to him and Dungey went around him. It could have been fatigue, could have been whatever. Um, but this week I think there was no doubting it. Marvin had that win in hand and then he kind of started looking around and then slowed up for the last couple of laps and then finally made a quote mistake in uh, the sweeper before the whoops and Dungey slides on by wins the main event um, and it, it sucks I get it like you know what Marvin deserved to win that race he was the one who was the fastest on the track that night and um, just outright beat Ryan Dungey I get it like that that's frustrating that Marvin doesn't get to win but I think it is kind of ridiculous how many people are shocked by the use of team tactics and just appalled that they could do something like this and I've lost all respect for KTM and everything that they stand for because of this um, because if none of you guys have realized this is a form of motorsport racing and team tactics have happened for years in motorsports in every discipline of motorsports including motocross and I see people trying to justify it with like well, motocross isn't a team sport. Why is it a team sport now? This is BS, blah, 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 blah. Um, hello, this sport in America, for that sense, was basically founded in, in its very early years off of team tactics being a major player in a championship. Um, for those of you that don't know, motocross was invented technically in Europe and, and brought to the USA when it came like in terms of a racing form it was much bigger in Europe earlier on than in the United States then it came to the USA 
And in the 70s, it started getting big. Now in the late 70s, this incident that I'm talking about here, um, Bob Hanna was handily winning the final national of the 125 championship, I believe in 1977. Um, but in order for Yamaha to win the championship with their star rider before Bob Hanna became the star rider, their star rider at the time, Brock Glover, um, they needed to do a flip-flop of positions where Bob Hanna needed to allow Brock Glover to win the race. And so on the final lap, the infamous uh, let Brock by in, uh, incorrectly spelled pit board was displayed and Bob Hanna pulled over, let Brock Glover win the race, uh, famously stormed off into the woods and uh, wasn't seen for a few hours, supposedly cried or something along those lines. He was just very frustrated. But obviously Bob Hanna would eventually become an icon for Yamaha and be one of the greatest riders in the history of the sport. So his career turned out okay. On to the point of the team orders, team tactics, whatever you want to call it. I just, I'm kind of shocked at how many people are just more or less like surprised by this or just thinking like it's BS because I mean, it, it happens. Like it totally happens. We've seen things like I would much rather what happened in this main event happen in a, in a team tactical sense than see some rider on an opposite team just get t-boned by someone's teammate a la kyle chisholm on chad reed in 2009 what he was trying to do essentially was just light up chad reed send him over a berm and ruin his chance of challenging james stewart for a championship i think that's much more like wow that's kind of ridiculous in a team tactical sense than letting your teammate your really good friend a guy that has given you a ton of help in the united states and is your training partner and is going to be out the door next year anyway, so who freaking cares if you let him win the championship this year because you're not in it anymore um, by to win a race. So, like, it it sucks. Yeah, Marvin did deserve to win that race. I get it, okay? Like, KTM installing team tactics sucks in the sense that Marvin deserved to win that race, but it doesn't suck in the sense that it exists. Team tactics exist everywhere. It exists primarily, hugely, in the bigger forms of motorsports, a la NASCAR and uh, Formula One and MotoGP, there's team tactics all across the board in those sports. Like they, they have teams in those series for a reason. And motocross isn't just like an exception to the rule. It's, it's, it's a form of motorsport and they use the team advantage that they have to their advantage. So, I mean, that that's my whole take on the situation. Like, I, as I said, Obviously, you don't want to see team tactics play a part in a championship outcome. In my opinion, they won't play a factor in this outcome. I think that even if Eli Tomac comes out this week in Las Vegas and just dominates this week, like nobody touches him, he wins the main event handily, whatever. If Ryan Dungey finishes third or better, then the team tactic thing doesn't even matter because Ryan Dungey will still win by a margin of greater than three points, which is what changed hands when Ryan Dungey won the main event in East Rutherford because Marvin let him by. Um, he gained three points that he otherwise would not have gotten uh, because of the team tactics thing. So obviously for a fan's sake and for a racing enthusiast's sake, I would have much preferred a situation this weekend at East Rutherford where Ryan Dungey wins the main event and Eli Tomac finishes second. So they go into Vegas tied and it has to be an actual shootout brawl for the uh, championship. But I mean, if you're gonna have to point a finger into what lost Eli Tomac this championship, it's not Marvin Muskan pulling over for Ryan Dungey to win a race in East Rutherford. It can be traced back to the three, four rounds at the beginning of the year that Tomac was having significant arm pump and couldn't get bike setup figured out and finished outside of the top five in three races. It could be traced back to the mechanical issue that happened on his bike in Dallas where his front brake failed and then he crashed and the rotor was messed up and they had to cut the front brake line and it took him forever to do that. Um, and it absolutely has to be traced back to the fact that Eli Tomac was leading the race in East Rutherford this past weekend and he himself crashed nobody helped him there he went onto the ground himself and it took him a while to get up so as i said it's kind of ridiculous to go all oh we got to put an asterisk on ryan dungy's championship because this is ridiculous and eli tomac is a much better rider and stuff like that which 
you know what? Maybe this year Tomac was. Maybe he was the better rider. But over a time span, over a championship, in a natural process, Ryan Dungey was more consistent, was more often at the front, had better average finishes, and if he wins the championship, he deserves it. it uh, you don't need to put asterisks next to people that, oh, uh, well, such and such wasn't there or whatever, so his championship doesn't count. Like, nobody looks at that in the record books. It's a championship in the record books, so. I know that's kind of a rant, and I'm not trying to, like, outspokenly defend Dungey here, but I just, like, don't get exactly where the, the racing fan exists when they don't see racing for exactly what it is. I mean, it's it's pure, it's raw, it's passion, but when it comes down to it, it's a business. All racing is a business, especially in motocross because all the manufacturers are involved. You know, when it comes to F1 and stuff like that, all the manufacturers are involved. When it came to IndyCar for a while, there was only one manufacturer involved, so it wasn't really like a team tactics thing so much as it was like a, um, well, these drivers, this, that, and the other thing, but I mean, when you have companies paying buku dollars to riders to have their brand win the championship, they're going to do whatever it takes to help that brand win the championship. And just like any job in the world, you're going to do what your boss says when your boss asks you to do it. Um, and that's just how the world <laughs> operates. Like I said, unfortunate that Marvin didn't win, but that's that's just how it plays out sometimes. All right, guys, so let's calm down with the burn Ryan Dungey at the stake because KTM is just a, a bag of dicks. Like, no, they're not. Every other team in the pits would have done it. They all know they would have done it too. Um, pretty much everybody is reasonably okay with the move, except for the fans that uh, were hoping to see a more pure sense of the racing aspect, which I get. But let's just calm down, okay? Still got one race to go, nine points in it. Tomac could still win the championship. Who knows what could happen in Vegas. It could rain again for all I care. Really don't know what's gonna happen. Um, it does set up a very interesting 250 West, um, I'm sorry, East title fight going down to the line because Zach Osborne put on a clinical ride through the field to take the win in East Rutherford. And the man he passed to get the win, Zach, uh, I'm all jumbled, Joey Savacci, then had a brain fart and a half and crashed in a rhythm section, then cut the track essentially when he rejoined, so he lost uh, five spots from his finishing spot, which eventually was third, ended up eighth at East Rutherford, lost the points lead to Jordan Smith, who was seemingly just completely out of it at East Rutherford, ends up with the points lead after a fairly off weekend, and uh, has a one point lead over both Osborne and Savacci going into the final round which will be the East-West shootout, which counts for points. Um, we saw all that craziness last year with Savachi winning the race and Webb struggling through a broken ankle and eventually winning the title. And then Mookie and Plessinger and chaos and rain and uh, anything can happen. It's always Vegas. You always got to roll the dice and never know what's going to happen. Uh, but the East Championship is the only one really left that's just to be decided. Obviously, we saw Justin Hill clinch the West Championship back at Salt Lake City, so those guys are all just kind of going out there for bragging rights at this point. If anybody wants to step up and win the East-West shootout, they have a good opportunity to this weekend. Um, obviously, some feathers could be ruffled in the mix here because we have a Rockstar Husqvarna, Pro Circuit Kawasaki, and Troy Lee Designs KTM rider all going for one championship on the East, and they have all of their teammates suddenly joining them from the West. Um, so, you know, you're going to have Savachi uh, probably getting some sort of aid in the sense from Forkner. Maybe Justin Hill gets involved a little bit. Um, Adam Ciancerillo would obviously maybe help coming on the east side from that. And then Rockstar Husky has Davalos to help out Osborne. And then Jordan Smith has... Um, Mitchell Oldenburg and Shane McElrath, who both just went 1-2 this past race at uh, Salt Lake City. So they're having a good time of things out on the West, and they can make things really interesting to help Jordan Smith win the championship when it comes to the East-West shootout. Um, that is probably the race I am most looking forward to because there is so, much, so many different storylines to follow in that series going into the final. And, and the fact that the East-West shootout counts for points now, I think is freaking amazing as a fan because it provides so much more drama for that main event that it didn't used to have because it was all about bragging rights before 
and the champions were already crowned and nobody really cared and um, you'd get some random winners sometimes so it was cool but as I said the, the fast guys weren't really going as fast sometimes because they're like well I won the championship or well my championship's over so who cares uh, but this is going to be a crazy weekend of racing in Las Vegas I'm really really looking forward to watching this one um, and uh, how about it I was uh, talking earlier in the season about how this championship could come down to the wire. Tomac taking this thing all the way to the end. And even though he had a rough weekend in New Jersey, he actually has taken it all the way to the end at this point. So uh, finally, we have a championship that goes to Las Vegas, the first of which to happen since 2011. when Ryan Villapoto won his first championship crown. So who knows? Could be another first crown for Tomac. Dungey could have a mechanical, he could have a brain fart, he could do something weird, but statistics show that Ryan Dungey is probably gonna finish fourth or better. At least that's happened pretty consistently for the last three years in every single main event he's raced in. So tough for Tomac, but we'll see. As for us and this series of the Encore videos, we're wrapping it up. I think I might do a wrap-up video of the season after the season is over on a uh, different track. I don't know what yet, but we'll see. If you guys like this video, go ahead, like, comment, subscribe. And we hope to see you guys in the future ones on the channel.